Hey everybody, it's Lon Sybin and it's time for your weekly wrap up and I want to begin as we always do by thanking our newest Patreon supporters and we got a bunch this week. Ryan Williams, Michael Olzwecki, Ken Anger- Anderad, I hope I got everybody's name pronounced right here, and Martin Kozegi, who made an upgrade to his Patreon support of the channel. I want to thank all of you who have contributed to the channel and everyone who watches on a regular basis too because we keep growing at a very steady pace and all of these factors combine to make a channel successful. So I want to thank all of you for your continued support. So we did a lot this week uh, because uh, I have the extras channel up now with a whole bunch of extra content and, of course, the main content on the main channel. So I uploaded a bunch of test footage from that Analog NT, uh, which is that uh, NES clone console powered by a field programmable gate array chip, but they have just uh, extended it a bit by uh, some jailbroken firmware that lets you run other consoles on it also. So you'll see uh, footage here of the ColecoVision, the Sega Master System, as well as the Game Gear and the NES. I also unboxed it so you can see that. And uh, somebody asked for a tour of my shelf behind me, and I had done that on a prior wrap-up, so I put that up there also so you can check that out and see what is behind me on the shelf. And speaking of the Analog NT, I had the review up this week also. It's about 15 minutes long, a really detailed explanation as to how it works as a NES clone console as well as uh, some of those other consoles it supports now as well. It is very expensive. It is targeted to uh, aging gamers like myself with maybe some disposable income, and that is uh, exactly how they got me into it. The I wasn't really going to look at getting one until that additional functionality was announced. So now it can uh, run ROMs off of SD cards on all these systems as well as uh, run all of those systems. And the designer of the uh, FPGA code to make this thing do what it does uh, is a guy by the name of Kevtris, and he's going to be adding additional cores to this machine over the next couple of weeks. So it's going to be adding additional systems to it also. I think it's pretty cool. I really like this concept, and I want to explore more of it, which is why uh, I made the plunge on it. So I'll be doing some more stuff on the Extras channel with that. And I also did a live stream with that Analog NT as I was first playing around with it. So you can check out the full hour and a half uh, session that I did as I was evaluating the product and interacting with all of you. It's kind of fun. I like to do these live streams from time to time. And unfortunately, I don't have a lot of ability to commit to a schedule of doing them just yet. I do want to do more scheduled live streams so you all know when to tune in. But I do these from time to time when I have some time and I got a cool thing to uh, test out. And it might be a fun way to do an interactive product evaluation. So I will do more of these. I definitely activate that little notification icon that you have in your uh, settings on my channel so that if I do go live, you'll get a notification on your mobile device so you can pop in and uh, participate. But I will start, hopefully, in the next couple of months uh, coming up with some kind of schedule where I do go live and you can all plan around that. But in the meantime, you might just see me randomly pop up. I got this little button on my TriCaster that when I hit it, it goes live and starts streaming right off the bat. It's really cool, and I uh, definitely want to do more of that. But in the meantime, you can watch the replay down in the master playlist below. We also, speaking of FPGAs, uh, looked into controller lag, especially involving emulators, because when we reviewed that game uh, controller a few weeks ago, I noted that uh, things didn't feel right to me, so I went out and did a pretty extensive uh, investigation, if you will, of a bunch of different controllers I had in the house, along with a bunch of different devices to see uh, how all of them compared, and sure enough, uh, there's a lot of button lag being introduced, not only by the controllers, but by the emulator, by the computer or tablet or phone that you're running on, and the display also. All of those things combined to uh, create some pretty decent lag here between the time you push a button and something happens on screen. So you can see uh, some examples of how that works as well as my methodology uh, in that video. And during that review, I did ask if any game developers might be watching to chime in on how they program around this lag issue. And Michael Gary wrote in to say that in his experience, they don't do anything to code around it. It's just a, a fact of life these days with all these different TVs and everything else. And he did say at the bottom here that a lot of developers prefer consoles because the hardware is fixed and identical across every installation, at least insofar as the game component is. Uh, TVs obviously will introduce some delay, but uh, I can see that might be a frustrating issue for game developers given that everyone's PC might perform a little bit differently in how it responds to controller lag. And I hadn't really given this issue much thought up until I did that controller review, and now I've been testing everything around the house just to get a feel for uh, where some of my bottlenecks are. And surprisingly, uh, my TV over there, my Samsung uh, 655 inch TV that I reviewed over the summer uh, is the best performer in the house. It is better than a Samsung gaming monitor. It is better than my 4K TV from LG upstairs, even when it's in game mode. Uh, it's a very fast responding panel on that TV, and I'm really surprised by how well everything works. And I've been testing it with that analog NT, which is a, uh, that really when you use that and push the button, there isn't a lot of uh, any lag really being introduced when you push the button on a wireless.
wired controller on that device because it is all hardware straight to the frame buffer essentially. So uh, it's been interesting just to kind of test that out around the house. But button lag is going to be a big issue. And I think as these TVs add more and more bells and whistles, uh, we might be seeing more of that. I've heard OLED TVs don't do all that well with, with, with response time. So I'd love to hear if you've been uh, finding anything on this issue I should be looking at because I'm really just intrigued by it. And uh, really, I think I know now why I'm not so good at the games I used to play as a kid because this button lag thing is uh, screwing up my muscle memory here. We also took a look this week at the Mi Air 13. And this is a great little laptop. If you're looking for a 13-inch laptop that can play some games decently or edit some video decently, uh, this one is definitely it. It's got an i5 Skylake processor, but it also has an NVIDIA GPU. It's a 940MX. Not crazy fast, but fast enough that you can play uh, GTA 5, for example, at 1080p with the settings turned down. Rocket League ran great on it. Uh, keeps itself relatively cool. Uh, really nice computer. And unfortunately, they're not selling this outside of China. You can get it from Gearbest and a few other places that uh, import things for you, but you won't get a lot of support as a result if something were to go wrong down the road. But if you are willing to take a risk on a nice computer, this one is definitely it. It's about $800 or so, but I think well worth it. We also took a look at the HD Home Run again uh, because they have added DRM playback on the Xbox One. And uh, many cable systems out there either protect uh, some channels, in other words, they put a flag on it to not let you watch uh, that channel on a non-approved device, or in some cases, uh, some cable systems flag everything, so people have a really hard time using HD Home Run Prime tuners with uh, specific cable operators. And now you can watch protected content on the Xbox One. They'll be adding Android support very shortly as well. You can check out what that's all about in this video if you're curious about that. And we also took a look at Plex and Amazon Alexa because Plex is going to be uh, sponsoring one video a month here on the channel where I go into depth on a Plex feature. So in this one, uh, we did some voice control of Plex and I showed you how it works. It's pretty cool. And especially if you're looking for uh, some recommendations, you can walk into your house and have it recommend something for you. And then it turns on your television and just plays it back automatically if you have an NVIDIA Shield TV or other Android uh, TV devices that support uh, the HDMI CEC protocol. Cool stuff. And now it's time for a couple of things that are on my mind. I was very surprised to see that the NVIDIA Shield tablet is getting another free Android uh, operating system upgrade. It's now going up to version 7. Now, uh, I've had these devices for a while now. I've, I bought one, and I think NVIDIA sent me the one that we're going to look at here in a second. And uh, these things have been around for a while. I got it first when it was on Android 5. It's been upgraded to 6, and now it's up to 7. It's almost unheard of to have a manufacturer actually support their hardware for this long, but uh, NVIDIA has been doing that. And the big changes in a uh, Nougat, at least from what I can see so far, is uh, standby battery life. On this device, I would sometimes forget to turn it off and leave it on standby for a day or two, and it would almost always be dead by the time I picked it back up again. Uh, this time, it was on standby for a day and a half and still had a pretty decent amount of charge left in it, which was uh, great. So that was a good improvement that I saw there. They've improved the uh, notifications a little bit as well, so they do now group things up by app, which is nice. You don't get a lot of junk uh, taking up a lot of space in there if the same app is uh, throwing off a lot of notifications. But the big big change, for me at least, is the fact that you can now do split-screen multitasking. So I can hold down the little button here, and what it'll do is split the screen up, and I have uh, YouTube running here on the side. I can just click on YouTube, and I'll go back to the beginning of this video, and I can play back video uh, and browse the web at the same time here, which is really cool. It is a small screen, obviously, at 8 inches, but uh, you do have some ability to adjust things a little bit as well. So I can make that uh, window smaller there, and the web browser here will uh, reflow. It'll also uh, allow you to do split screen when you're in portrait mode as well. So lots of cool little features here, and again, they're still supporting this tablet after a good amount of time, actually, which is really nice to see that happening in Android world, because that doesn't usually happen in Android worlds. So I was very pleased to see that. Another thing in the news here is that Verizon is giving you, un well, selling you uh, unlimited data again. And uh, it is unlimited in the sense that you can uh, use up to 22 gigabytes on your mobile device. And if you go over 22, they'll throttle you down to 3G speeds for the rest of the month. But Still, it's a quite a big improvement. They're going to charge about 80 bucks a month for this on a single line. And if you are tethering, they give you 10 gigabytes of data for that. And I think after that, you'll get uh, slowed down as well. But it's good to see this happening. And this is another example of when there's competition in a marketplace, people tend to compete with each other. And they're doing this in response to T-Mobile uh, taking away data caps on video playback. Verizon said that uh, their video playback will not reduce the resolution of the video, which is what is happening apparently on T-Mobile. So great to see all 
this volleying back and forth. And at least here in the U.S., we have, I think, three or four uh, large uh, mobile carriers to choose from on top of a bunch of others that resell uh, time on those carriers. So we do have a good amount of choice in that area of the marketplace. And I would love to see this kind of choice happening on the consumer broadband level, but I'm not holding my breath. And now it's time for some Q&A, and I got a great question in here from Milty C in response to my review of the second generation NVIDIA Shield TV console. So you saw they changed that console, they made it smaller, uh, they cut out some things to shave some costs out of it, and uh, one of the things they cut out was the Wi-Fi controller connectivity. So on the old console, if you had that uh, big controller, it would connect up via Wi-Fi, which was faster than uh, the Bluetooth now that is driving the new controller. So that new controller does not have that Wi-Fi direct built into it, and there is a a performance difference. I tested it the same way I tested everything else on the same TV with the same emulator, and I saw a 44 millisecond difference between the new controller and the old one. So the old controller uh, would respond to a button press in that Sonic game in about 84 milliseconds. Uh, the new one goes in at around 128 milliseconds. It's definitely above the point where you begin to notice some uh, button latency when you're playing some of these retro games, and that's a pretty big difference between the old and the new, and that was part of the reason why uh, the NVIDIA Shield devices we're running with these Wi-Fi controllers in the first place to minimize lag, and now it's back, unfortunately, and uh, it's really performing no better than other Bluetooth controllers at the moment, and that's a bit of a disappointment because that's been one of the big selling points of that console. Uh, on a related note, though, I found this great website called the Human Benchmark, and what they do is they uh, measure how fast you can react to uh, something changing on screen. So they have this box that turns from red to green, and when it turns green, you got to click as fast as you can, and they measure uh, how quickly you can respond to it, and they've been doing this for a while and they've collected some data obviously and they are noting that the reaction times have gotten slower over the years and they're not blaming it on the humans they're blaming it on display technology and this is going to be a big issue for gamers moving forward because uh, these displays are not very fast and this is really impacting uh, the ability of players to play their games very well. I'm even seeing gaming monitors that don't perform all that great and uh, this is surprising actually so uh, but no surprise here to these folks who've been measuring uh, this decline as these, these these uh, display technologies have uh, gotten better images but are slowing down the response rate on a lot of these games and whatnot. And Laura Kay writes in with a question that I do get from time to time from folks and that is uh, whether or not one of these sheet fed scanners that I look at here on the channel from time to time uh, makes sense for photo scanning and it's a very attractive proposition because you know these, these document scanners can really crank it out and they all have photo settings but I don't recommend these things as photo scanning devices because I think it will put your photos at risk. They will definitely get scratched as they run through there because all it takes is one piece of grit to get on the roller and uh, they're moving so fast it'll definitely put a gouge or two uh, into your photos as they're going through. But it could also crumple up your photos in the course of scanning as well. So you really need to be careful about using these things as photo scanners. And unfortunately, photo scanning is a very tedious task because there's a lot to do. After the photo comes in, you might want to brush the scratches out or do uh, some additional work on the photo. And I found it takes forever. And I have a big pile of photos. I mean, I'm talking rooms full of photos here that I've been collecting over the last 15 years or so before I started shooting digital that I've been meaning to scan and just haven't gotten around to it because I know it's going to take weeks to get uh, everything in there, even if I spent every minute of my day doing it. So I think the best solution is if you really have a lot of photos to scan, uh, there are services out there that will take uh, your stuff in bulk and uh, get it on a disc for you in high resolution. They have much better scanning equipment than a desktop scanner might be, especially one that's more designed for documents than photos. So I think your results will be much better there. Even if it costs a little bit of money, it might just be worth it to uh, get it done right in a way that you know your photos will come back to you in the same condition in which you sent them into the place to scan them. So that would be my advice on bulk photo scanning. And Tech Reviews writes in with what I think is a very good discussion point regarding smart televisions and app updates. So in this case, Tech Reviews has a 2012 Vizio television that no longer gets any updates. Nothing seems to work on it anymore. YouTube is not working or hasn't been updated. Uh, the Amazon app is completely dysfunctional and uh, he's really not happy that he bought a TV with certain functionality that although the TV still works fine as a television, it doesn't do all the smart stuff that it did uh, when it was purchased. And this is an issue I think with uh, many TV manufacturers also many tablet and phone manufacturers too. They just stop supporting their old models because there's no more money to be made from them. And especially uh, when you look at a company like Vizio, which is kind of a loss leader. They make very little margin on these televisions. Their only way to make more money is to make more TVs and not updating the old ones. And of course their uh, revenue stream violating your privacy that we talked about a week or two ago where they were taking uh, viewer data from you and selling it. Uh, they can't do that anymore because they got caught. So uh, there really is nothing to be made on these smart TVs. You might take 
take some solace in the fact that they probably can't spy on you anymore with that TV, but uh, by and large, you're pretty much stuck or having to go out and buy a box to supplement what your TV doesn't do anymore. I'm not sure what to say. I mean, I think this is a, a problem that will uh, persist for quite some time. I, I think it's probably presenting some challenge to the TV manufacturers also because they have to decide at what point do they pull support for uh, TVs that will likely last five or 10 years. So I'm just curious what you have experienced with your televisions. Uh, so far, my smart TVs are still supported, but who knows? We'll see what happens in a year or two as they get a little bit older. But that's why I like my extra boxes that I have plugged into my TVs to supplement whatever might go away in the future. And Clay Mann writes in with a question about Amazon Alexa and the add-on skills that you can bring to the mix. And as you saw in that Plex video, we added the Plex skill uh, to Alexa so that when I asked a Plex question through the Alexa, it would route it over to my Plex server. But the problem here that Clay brings up and one that I agree with is the fact that you have to remember to put the Ask Plex on first before you issue the command. In the case of something like media, if you forget to say that, it'll start playing back media on your Alexa device instead of uh, through your Plex server. And that's something you have to remember for every different thing that you want to talk to. Uh, there's no way to maybe uh, code it so you can uh, just have it know that you want a Plex thing to play when you ask for a movie. That'd be a nice thing for them to add, but right now it seems like you have to really uh, learn your, your lines essentially to uh, go in and ask this thing a question. So I would like to see that get improved a bit. I'm really curious to see how uh, Google Home begins integrating other services with what it's doing. I think they're going to try to make it a little bit more of an integrated experience. I have a Google Home that I really am liking quite a bit. It doesn't have the skill set, though, that Alexa has, but it does have a lot more intelligence for ask, answering questions that I'm asking it. So I'm really eager to see uh, how they uh, plan to roll out some of the third-party support for it. It should be neat uh, to see how these two platforms develop. And on that note, my Q&A for you this week is, uh, what are some of the things that you're controlling with your Alexa or your Google Home? I'm really eager to see some other examples that I might look at in the future for uh, controlling things around your home or life uh, with your voice, because there are quite a few skills available on the Amazon Alexa store. I'm just looking to see what you all are doing. So let me know uh, down in the comments below. It'll be a fun discussion to have about how we're controlling things with our voice and hopefully not getting spied on in the process. And my channel of the week this week is The Daily Woo. I wanted to find some more non-tech channels to share with you. I love this channel. Uh, this is a really cool guy. So he's been out for the last couple of years now uh, just doing a daily vlog of his travels around the United States. You never know where he's going to go. It's not always the most exciting stuff to see, but he really does a very nice job of painting a tapestry of his travels and he always tries to find uh, new and interesting things to share with the world. And one of the things that I love that he does is he goes out and finds these small towns all over uh, the United States. I live in a small town, so I kind of appreciate small town life. And it's really nice to see other small towns in different parts of the country that he visits. And he always finds these really odd little tidbits to share with everyone. Really nice guy, really just fun to watch what he does. And he's got a very uh, nice, relaxed feel to his content. What's most amazing about this, first of all, is the fact that he does one every day and he edits primarily on his iPhone. And you can see over the years how the technology has improved in his phones because his video quality is better. It's more stable just because the iPhones have gotten better uh, over the years in recording. But still pretty amazing that uh, this guy's making a living essentially off of his smartphone as he's traveling the country and sharing his travels with all of you. And like I said, he does it every single day, 15 to 20 minutes per video. It's pretty remarkable uh, what he's been doing here. And I hope, uh, hopefully he comes by my town one day and I can show him around. It'd be kind of fun to uh, meet up with someone who's really working hard on an awesome channel. He had another channel also, uh, which was as frequently updated and this one kind of took over uh, and he's really focusing now on uh, these daily vlogs and they're really a lot of fun to watch so I definitely suggest checking it out. I watch them every morning with my, my breakfast. It's a nice fun way to start the day. So this week I've got something really cool that just came in from Lenovo. As you know I love getting uh, low to mid-range laptops in for review. This is the new 510S. It is powered by the new 7th generation KB Lake processor. I think this one has an i7. I haven't unboxed it yet but you'll see it when I uh, unbox it on the Extras channel. But it also has an AMD the GPU on board. It's the R7 M460. Not to be confused with the chip in the new MacBook Pro. This is a different lower end uh, graphics processor, but it has one which many laptops at the mid-range do not. So we'll see how uh, well this one performs versus some of the NVIDIA uh, devices we have seen in that same uh, price or, or product category. So that'll be kind of a fun review. I'm going to try to get to this one next. So look for that one in the next couple of days. I got a mesh router from Linksys that I'm just finishing up testing and I probably have some other stuff too that you'll find of interest, even a, a low-cost Thunderbolt 3 dot all of which I hope to get to this week, provided all my time works out the way I think it's going to work out. You never know what's, what's going to get thrown your way, but I hope to get a lot of cool things done for you this week. Now, if you want to help the channel, you can. You can go to lon.tv slash Patreon and make a monthly contribution to the channel. We also have YouTube fan funding set up at lon.tv for a one-time contribution, 
We're also working with Plex lately on a cool affiliate program. So if you sign up on Plex without even having to purchase anything, uh, we get a small commission for that account creation. So a really cool way to help out the channel and get into a cool service at the same time. You can also give a gift of a Plex pass at lon.tv slash Plex gift to help the channel out as well if you already have one. You can also engage with the channel at lon.tv slash extras. We got the email list at lon.tv slash email. You can go on my Facebook page where I post all the time, lon.tv slash Facebook. And of course, we got the store where I sell things that I have reviewed, things that I purchased, and I'm now reselling. And occasionally, I will uh, do a virtual giveaway where I give away something just for the cost of shipping on things that may have come into the channel for free. So definitely check out uh, lon.tv slash store frequently. I'm going to work on some way of notifying you when I do update the store. I tend to do it every Sunday when I'm cleaning up around uh, the space here. So that might be one thing to look for. But I definitely want to make sure people get notified when new things are in the store. And there are a few things that are in there right now that you can take a look at. So definitely check it out. That's how I uh, fund everything. I buy things, review them, and resell them at a discount. It's great for you, great for me, and we can keep all the stuff moving through the channel here. So that's going to do it for this week here on the channel. This is Lon Seibin. I want to thank you all for watching and your continued support and your comments and suggestions and all the other good things that uh, come into the relationship that we are building together. So I want to thank you all again, and that'll do it for this week's weekly wrap-up. Stay tuned for more reviews to come this week. This is Lon Seibin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by my Patreon supporters. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash Patreon to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.